For those just joining right now, we'll just wait another minute or two for more uh, participants to join. But in the meantime, please feel free to use the chat to uh, introduce yourself, uh, including your organization and uh, where you're joining this chat from. All right, then, I think uh, we'll begin and uh, others will join as they come along. And thank you for those who already started introducing themselves in the chat. Um, welcome uh, and thank you for joining us. Uh, and welcome to this session being hosted by the Global Interagency Security Forum, GISF, looking at security in urban and densely populated environments as part of HMPW. Um, my name is Dimitri Katsiris, and I'm the Research and Programs Manager at GISF, and I'll be chairing this meeting. I have a number of colleagues uh, in this call who are supporting from the back end in terms of technical support and uh, some note taking. Um, before beginning, perhaps we can start with a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, items. So uh, if you can kindly just mute your mics uh, if you're not speaking uh, to allow um, the, the voices to come clearly. And then of course, uh, please feel free to raise your hands and, and write questions in the chat, um, during, especially during uh, our Q&A portion later in the in this session. And then uh, includes, of course, uh, your organization where possible. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, I will begin by presenting uh, the panelists who will be joining this, this, this session and who will be speaking on behalf of this issue. Um, first, we have uh, Dr. Rob Grace, who's a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at Boston University. He's got a background in humanitarian negotiations, security risk management, civilian protection, and uh, civil mill coordination. And he's led lots of projects with the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies at Brown University, and uh, the Center for Civilians in Conflict, among others. Um, our second panelist is uh, Shashwat Saraf, who is the Regional Emergency Director for East Africa with the International Rescue Committee. Uh, he's worked in his home country of India for the past, uh, well, for seven years um, on social inclusion and good governance. And then afterwards, he spent another 10 years um, doing various um, jobs, particularly with the um, Action Against Hunger um, in various countries in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. And uh, he's led pro he's been a country director in Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Somalia, Nepal, Jordan, Iraq, uh, Nigeria, Kenya, and Tanzania. Uh, so as you can see, he's got a wide range of experience in different contexts around the world. And then lastly, our final panelist is Roman Choma, who's a security specialist with UN Women and based in Ukraine. Um, he uh, is a British national who served 25 years as a UK Royal Marines commando and deployed to numerous operational theaters uh, in Northern Ireland, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And uh, since then has become uh, an int intelligence director for maritime security company, providing armed uh, protection for merchant shipping. Uh, that's transitioned the, the uh, various uh, waterways in the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, and the Gulf of Aden, among others. And then he established his own um, research and security cell for security sector reform program and the liberated areas of Idlib and Aleppo in Syria and uh, has done various um, uh, tasks around security risk management and security compliance responsibilities for a, a multi-million dollar um, counter radicalization program in East Africa. And as of March 22, uh, he's been following the invasion, um, basically after the invasion, sorry, of the Russian Federation forces and their proxies, uh, Roman joined UN Women, and that's where he is currently today in Ukraine. So um, I'm gonna give you a bit of a breakdown of the agenda for this particular session. I'll begin by saying a couple of words to kind of frame the, the, the issue. And then um, Rob Grace will jump in and uh, begin a presentation on a new uh, research article that GISF has published earlier this year 
entitled Good Practices, Lessons Learned, and the Unique Challenges Affecting Security Risk Management in Urban Humanitarian Responses. And he'll be discussing various key takeaways from that research and uh, you know things that are, are meant to provide some food for thought for this conversation. Um, and my colleagues will be able to um, put the link on the chat uh, in a moment. Uh, there we are. Uh, then we'll have interventions from both Shashwat and Roman in their respective uh, contexts. They'll bring in the perspectives from their experience in doing operations in, uh, in, in various contexts. In Shashwat's case, will be primarily right now where he's focused in East Africa, but he could bring some of his experience looking into Asia and Afghanistan, for instance. And then uh, Roman will talk about the unique security dynamics uh, that are at play in humanitarian operations in Ukraine. And we'll, we'll provide a bit of a deep dive in that context more specifically. Uh, this will be give or take 30-ish to 40 minutes. And then the rest of the time we'll have uh, a, an open conversation that will be in a questions and answers format. And we very much encourage your participation, your active participation. You can either put a, a question in the chat or uh, raise your hand and we'd be happy, happily have you unmute your, your mic and just ask your question directly to the panelists. Uh, I can also chime in myself. And we also would encourage people to speak about their own experiences and their own um, um, understanding of, of uh, you know, security risk management in urban environments that they operate in. So to start, I just wanted to ask the question, why are we talking about this issue and why do we think it's important? Um, we all know that there's been a longstanding trend of rapid urbanization around the world. Most people live uh, in cities and towns around the world. And we've seen from various studies over the past decade that warfare is increasingly taking place in cities. They were historically seen as sort of safe havens and civil conflicts and so on, but it hasn't been as much the case anymore. Um, and they're talking about the phenomenon of urban warfare being a reality already. Uh, this can happen in various ways. There's a sort of jockeying of power and authority between warring parties. There are power vacuums sometimes in fragile contexts where there's a um, reduced governance and that can that vacuum can be filled by armed uh, gangs and criminal gangs uh, who can operate in those spaces. And then of course, all this leads to disproportionate numbers of casualties and uh, and negative impacts for civilian populaces in those in those affected environments, from crossfire, collateral damage to indiscriminate fire, and uh, and everything else that comes with it. And uh, you see that this is very much a global trend. Um, of course, at the forefront, you have the the ongoing um, crisis that's happening in Gaza Strip, uh, where most of the conflict is happening or being concentrated in the urban environments across Gaza. And then you have the imminent uh, incursion into uh, Rafah with 1.5 million people. Uh, uh, at risk in this in this case, more so than they have been before, and that's been raising alarm bells everywhere. You, of course, have um, what Roman's going to talk more at length about, the case in in, uh, in Ukraine with uh, the interstate conflict between Ukraine and, and Russia and their proxies, and the aerial bombardments of major cities in the eastern portion of Ukraine, from the Donbass region to Kharkiv and Mariupol, Odessa, and of course, even the capital, Kyiv. And you also have ongoing crises, things that have uh, broken out in Khartoum and Sudan. You had the, the Taliban takeover in Kabul uh, not long ago. You had, of course, the longstanding conflicts that were happening in Syria and Aleppo and Raqqa uh, or in Iraq back in the day with, with Baghdad and Mosul and, and the instability there, ongoing conflicts in Yemen, and of course, uh, examples of criminal gangs taking over big portions of the city like in Port-au-Prince and Haiti. And the, the list goes on and on. Um, and the... This begs the question about what kind of unique elements need to be considered when you're talking about security risk management versus in remote and rural uh, settings. You know, there are things that uh, Rob will be expanding on, but some dynamics to consider are, you know, the density of the populations that that uh, live in those spaces, the the sprawling urban structures that are there that, uh, you know, provide very narrow corridors for both uh, movement and and, uh, and delivery. Uh, to the diversity of those populations and the fact that many of these uh, centers are strategic hubs or um, centers where political activity is at its highest point or the, um, the tensions between different political actors are, can be manifested uh, more directly. And so this is really where, uh, you know, just trying to emphasize why urban environments are, are a, a frame to think about when you're, when you're talking about humanitarian security and operations. And this is where I will pass on um, the conversation to Rob, uh, and I'll pass the mic to Rob to present on that research article uh, that is linked in the chat below to expand upon some of these things that I've been teasing out and talk about the unique dynamics and certain potential pathways to take to, to respond to this. So Rob, please take it away. Thanks very much. I'm just going to share my slides here. 
Okay. Um, yes. Thank you for those intro remarks, Dimitri. I think you queued it up all uh, very well. Um, and just to build on what Dimitri said, I'll say that this uh, report that I will be uh, presenting that um, I worked on GISF uh, with in presenting this report, I present a thesis to you all, uh, a hypothesis. And that hypothesis is that there are particularities of uh, uh, humanitarian response in urban uh, settings, uh, you know, many of which uh, Dimitri just uh, hit on. I don't think that part of it is controversial. But the part of it that we're hoping to push forward in this discussion here and potentially beyond is that those particularities and those particular challenges of humanitarian response in urban contexts might necessitate specific SRM approaches or might warrant a specific discussion about what it means to do humanitarian SRM in densely populated areas and to push that forward as a particular thread of a conversation uh, amongst a community of practice of SRM professionals in a way that it hasn't been done uh, before. Um, so that's why we're here today, to uh, float that out to you and hear uh, all of your uh, perspectives uh, on it. So I'll kick it off by just drilling down a bit more deeply on some of the points that uh, Dimitri uh, laid out, uh, just talking about the key challenges of humanitarian response in uh, urban settings. Um, and this is from the report that I wrote for GISF. The, the link to the report is in the chat, so I encourage you to take a look at it. Um, interested to hear your thoughts about the full report uh, as well. And, and this research is based on key informant interviews that I uh, conducted, uh, as well as uh, a review of existing uh, literature. And what I found is that, you know, as many of you probably know, there is a lot written about humanitarian response in urban settings, uh, but not much written on particularly humanitarian SRM in urban settings, at least in a way that extracts common lessons from looking at different types of contexts. But okay, that being said, here are some dynamics of um, uh, urban humanitarian response that uh, are particular to densely uh, populated settings. You have high population density, of course, that's what we're talking about. But the implication is that you will have a high level of humanitarian need concentrated in a very small uh, area. If you're talking about a um, disaster stemming from natural hazards, earthquake, flooding, uh, you're talking about many people with needs concentrated you know, in a city in one uh, particular location. If you're talking about an armed conflict, you're talking about a um, uh, population that is in close proximity to... ...is able to be exposed to the knowledge, uh, and then they will yeah. also increase the... Sorry, Rob. Uh, it's okay. It's possible to mute um, your mic, please. Um, thank you very much. Rob, please continue. I think it's muted. You know, uh, it happens. It happens. It's a, you know... It's the Zoom world. Um, but that's the high population density is, okay, we have uh, very high levels of humanitarian need concentrated in a particular area. So that's a challenge in and of itself. Uh, but coupled with that is the fact that within a city, populations tend to be diverse. You will have a lot of inequality. You will have certain communities and certain people and families who do have networks of informal uh, support. You will, in a city, have um, certain uh, forms of formal governmental support. So it poses a challenge for humanitarians in terms of how to actually assess uh, what the needs are, especially if they're varying a lot uh, based on different uh, communities and based on uh, different locations. So high concentration of need, but even within that high concentration of need, uh, potentially great variation across different segments of that population in terms of what exactly the levels of need uh, are. And of course, you have the standard uh, urban uh, violence, uh, the standard day-to-day -day, um, SRM uh, activities, um, uh, that uh, will patterns of which will be different in an urban setting than they will be uh, in a rural setting. Um, and finally, also Dimitri uh, hit on this one uh, as well. Uh, cities tend to be locus of political activity. So you have governmental officials 
who themselves might be targets of violence. Cities during civil wars will be key territory for parties to arm conflict uh, uh, to uh, try to capture and maintain. So you will see uh, potentially high levels of uh, armed conflict. Um, that's where you see uh, siege warfare uh, happening. It's it's in densely populated uh, areas. Uh, and you can also have um, uh, demonstrations, political protests uh, in cities as well, and that can pose uh, challenges for humanitarians as well. So, okay, just laying that out, uh, delving a bit more deeply into the key challenges um, uh, in general of humanitarian response uh, in urban settings. Uh, likely many of you in this room, you all know this, but this is just to sort of name it, give vocabulary on it, uh, give us all a, a common baseline of what we're talking about. Uh, before we shift to the particular SRM uh, dimensions of it. So I'll lay out a few dimensions here. These dimensions are not necessarily specific to uh, urban centers necessarily. They they span, you know, SRM more broadly. But as I lay these out, I'll speak specifically about how these issues play out in densely populated um, settings. So here we go. Um, the first one is applying IHL as a tool of uh, SRM. And this came up in my research and it's something that I have um, written about before in a previous publication. I'll be happy to share that link um, uh, in the chat. But essentially, at least in an armed conflict setting, the notion is that many of your SRM challenges come from the failure of IHL to actually succeed in protecting you from you as humanitarians from the violence of uh, armed conflict. And if we look at um, the past couple decades, many of the key incidents that have um, uh, served as uh, drawing attention to humanitarian insecurity and become focus points for advocacy that has an IHL uh, aspect to the discourse, they they have happened in cities. We're talking about Baghdad in 2003, Kunduz 2015, Juba 2016, siege warfare uh, in Syria, and what we see now uh, in Gaza, Ukraine, um, in Sudan, whether it's Khartoum uh, or elsewhere, um, these are incidents that have happened uh, in in cities. So I just uh, draw attention to that as um, highlighting the centrality of uh, urban SRM to the broader uh, discourse on uh, SRM writ large. The second one is balancing hard and soft approaches. This came up in my discussions with him, interviewees as well in this um, in this research project. The standard um traditional uh conversation and debate in the world of SRM about this going back to the the security triangle and striking a balance between uh a, a protection approach a deterrence approach on one side and then on the other side uh acceptance as a softer approach um but talking about specifically the urban um aspects of it um in my uh, discussions with interviewees I still heard much a concern about uh, green zones. And this is an urban phenomenon. We're talking about Mogadishu, uh, Baghdad, uh, a hardened security zone um, that it, it, interviewees expressed being at odds with an acceptance uh, approach and segmenting humanitarians off from uh, local communities that they're aiming uh, to serve. An additional element that I uh, heard, a story, a recurrent story that I heard in different contexts about um, challenges related to um, effectively implementing uh, hard security approaches um, is essentially different organizations essentially, essentially mimicking one another in terms of what hard security measures they uh, adopt, whether it's fencing, security cameras, um, other measures as well. But what I heard essentially is basically uh, what can happen is a race to get harder and a race to be the uh, 
organization that has hardened itself the most. Uh, so you see organizations that have certain measures uh, in place, then you have a new organization that comes in, sets up an office, and then sees what other organizations have, have done, mimics that, but then maybe takes a few additional um, hardening approaches, and then other organizations see that, and then they harden a little bit more. And there's sort of a race to hardening, which is basically based on what other organizations are doing and is not actually done in response to what the actual security risks are uh, in uh, in the context. So I, I heard that from interview, interviewees as a specific uh, challenge that people have seen uh, manifest in, in urban settings. Uh, three, implementing principled humanitarian uh, action. So this relates to an acceptance approach and again is a, a you know, standard ongoing conversation in the world of uh, SRM, uh, I know, but came up uh, in the interviewees, um, in, in the interviews I conducted for uh, this report, but specifically as part of an acceptance approach of uh, gaining acceptance from the local community based on the notion that you're implementing impartial, neutral, independent humanitarian action and the challenge that goes along with that, especially connected to the challenge of identifying needs in the local community and partnering with uh, local uh, organizations and local networks. Uh, one example that came up uh, in my conversations was if you're partnering with a local religious uh, network or, or religious organization, that local organization is going to gain you access to a local community, but that community will be linked to that religious organization. And if you are working through that local organization, then you are essentially de facto um, uh, providing aid uh, to a particular religious group as opposed to basing it on needs. So I heard that challenge referenced by um, uh, by an interviewee specifically uh, in relation to their work uh, in an urban uh, setting. And the fourth uh, and final item I'll, I'll highlight is negotiating safe and secure uh, access. Uh, humanitarian negotiation as well as something I've um, uh, studied a lot. I can happy to share some uh, other publications of mine uh, in the chat. Um, but essentially in uh, an urban setting, you have different types of actors with whom you need to negotiate. Uh, armed gangs as a, a particular humanitarian negotiation interlocutor uh, has presented challenges to uh, humanitarians as a different type of counterpart to engage with, as well as uh, striking a balance between negotiating with community leaders and the government at different levels, um, uh, as well as uh, the local affected population too. And another aspect I'll, I'll highlight is during an armed conflict, of course, you will always have uh, different parties to armed conflict controlling territory, but the dynamics in which it, by which that can play out in an urban setting um, can be very different than in a rural setting. And in an urban setting, uh, it can entail uh, needing to negotiate access uh, on a block by block basis. Uh, territorial control can shift very rapidly on a very uh, uh, minutia type of scale. And the challenge of assessing the environment and assessing who one needs to engage with in order to gain and maintain access can require even more sustained effort and more uh, more attention in an urban, in urban context. So there you go. There, those are some things that I lay out, but very interested to hear uh, your thoughts in the Q&A. And I know that the um, panelists that follow me will uh, hopefully illustrate uh, from their own experience um, uh, some ways in which some of these issues and other issues uh, have manifested. Um, and uh, again, I put the overall question uh, out there is to what extent it is useful to carve out urban SRM as a specific thing from the standpoint of research, but also from the standpoint of community of practice and bringing together um, people who have worked in different urban settings that might uh, benefit from sharing experiences with one another. All cities are different, but there might be certain commonalities that um, across different contexts that we can extract lessons learned and, and uh, cross pollinate in ways that, um, uh, that might be useful. Thanks very much. Thank you, Rob, for that uh, insightful presentation and for helping to present the, the sort of wider uh, challenges and dimensions that need to be considered in this space. And I'd also encourage you, Rob, during the Q&A portion to try to 
formulate that question in the chat so that uh, people can uh, be able to respond more directly to it uh, so that they're, they're, they have a refresher. Um, so I'll pass it on to Shashua to talk about his experience as a uh, you know, person who's more focused on operations, as a regional director in East Africa, uh, and with lots of experience in different contexts around the world. Uh, what kind of um, additional thoughts you want to bring to the table regarding security risk management in urban environments? Thanks. Um, I, what I'll try and do is I'll try and um, look at some of the instances where uh, operationally as a humanitarian organization in an urban setting, we had to navigate um, security and, and manage risks. Um, some where one had to find uh, ways and innovative ways to do, and some which still continue to be a challenge and dilemma. And for us to then think through in the Q&A section as to how can we navigate some of that space. Um, I, I would like to talk, uh, start from an example of Afghanistan, Kabul, where we could see that Apologies, Shashwat, I think your connection might have uh, disconnected, at least on my end. Um, if we would all just indulge for a moment to see if his connection will get back on track. Thank you, one moment. All right, it's very possible that Shashwat simply has a technical issue, a uh, connection issue. So, um, oh, I see he's trying to reconnect, if I'm not mistaken. Again, apologies, it's uh, Zoom uh, chats are always uh, running into technical errors. Well, until uh, Shashwat um, joins us, um, perhaps we can just move on to, to Roman uh, to discuss from his perspective some of the unique uh, security, uh, humanitarian security challenges that he faces in his context in Ukraine, where there's an active conflict going on. Please go ahead, Roman. Dimitri, thank you very much. And colleagues, thank you all for, for joining this presentation. Um, I'd like to talk briefly then about the, the context of Ukraine, uh, which is in itself a fairly unique context, um, because what we have is we have a, a UN member state uh, that has launched a, uh, an invasion of the territorial uh, sovereignty of another UN member state. So we have effectively, you know, peer on peer um, war fighting in effect. Um, if we look at how the UN ordinarily assesses risk, and um, we look at the five categories of crime, terrorism, armed conflict, civil unrest, and hazards, in this particular context, uh, it's only really the armed conflict that we're, we're considering. The rest are really negligible, certainly in most of the operations or most of the locations where the UN operates in Ukraine. And even within the armed conflict category, um, the, it's the, the main risk to us really is, or the main threat to us really, is from missile strikes. So, you know, this is a, a major challenge for us because ordinarily when you're working in an urban environment, the threat tends to be in proximity to you. Whereas in the Ukraine context, the threat could be a thousand kilometers away on a, a battle cruiser in the Sea of Azov or in a submarine or in a, a tuple of bomber uh, flying in Belarus airspace. So. We're not able to address those um, those threats um, directly. So, looking at the um, some of the categories that Robert identified in his paper, uh, the key operational challenges. First and foremost, you know, high population density. Um, as I said, with the main threat being from missiles, um, it's not just the, um, the 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 population that obviously um, is, at, is at risk from that but also UN staff members. Now, we're fairly lucky in Kiev and some of the biggest cities in Ukraine that we have a um, relatively effective air defense system, or the Ukrainians have a relatively effective air defense system. So it means that a high percentage of missiles that are fired at us are actually intercepted. However, in addition to those that do occasionally get through, um, we also have the issue of falling debris. So a lot of damage and a lot of injuries and a lot of deaths have been caused simply by bits of missiles that have actually been intercepted and shot out of the sky. Um, the other thing about having sort of um, 
big um, numbers of staff in in um, in urban areas is certainly in our context the the footprint of, of the UN here has increased rapidly, and the resources that we have to to provide them with security haven't sort of caught up with that or, or kept pace with it. So one of the things we have to be constantly on our guard for is um, relocation of staff. Um, now. With a, a sort of a limited amount of UN official vehicles in in, uh, in Ukraine, what I've had to do, or what all the other agencies have had to do, is develop this sort of relocation plan, uh, which not only uses um, official vehicles but relies on personal vehicles as well. Um, so we've had to do, we've had to come up with plans, we've had to um, exercise this, we've had to um, uh, brief it continuously to our staff because. One of the things that was a, a bit of a, um, a, a sort of leftover from from the the previous um, from the, the initial invasion was the fact that our um, relocation wasn't particularly well managed or run. So it's something that that really provides stress to our colleagues, and we have to uh, have to sort of reassure them by exercising it regularly. Um, then, if we look at the sort of uh, link to another a key operational challenge that Robert identified in the. Um, in the uh, dynamics of urban infrastructure. Of course, we, one of the things when we, we look to, to identify location for offices uh, and UN premises is that they need to be sort of a certain distance from things like government um, buildings, military installations, et cetera, et cetera. But here in Ukraine, one of the other things that we have to, to, to be very careful of is that we don't locate them too close to any sort of power generation facilities because uh, as most of you will know, the, the, the Russian Federation forces have attacked the critical infrastructure here in Ukraine uh, quite substantially, certainly over last winter and certainly in the last, last month or so. But also now we're having to uh, consider things like train depots, because with the announcement of the aid uh, bill being passed by the, the US Senate, um, of course, all that aid has to get into country somehow, and it's likely to come along key roads and rail infrastructure. So now any sort of proximity to, to rail depots uh, is a problem for us because we know that they're going to get attacked. So the only really ways we can mitigate the, the key threats to us here in Ukraine is firstly and foremost to have a good um, alert system in place. So we rely heavily here on apps, uh, which which all staff members have on their phones, which alert them to the to the, uh, the the threat of air raids. And also we have um, public address systems and such like. One of the downsides to it is that we have certainly experienced a little bit of, let's say, complacency, because you might get nine um, air raid alerts and only one of them will result in any sort of uh, missile strike or interception. So it's a challenge for us to keep our colleagues motivated and to make sure they do respond to, to, to all of our um, air alerts. But then we provide extra measures such as every office that we have, uh, we have a subsurface shelter. Um, we've had Secure, uh, shutter resistant film um, uh, fitted to all offices and also uh, in our case to all our uh, staff's personal residences as well. Um, but also we have to consider that when we move around the city, whether it be for, for meetings in the city or we move to, to other urban locations, we have to know where the closest shelter is. And that shelter might be a metro station or it might be an underpass or something like that which is fine in the in the, the bigger cities because you have these, but as you go to the smaller urban pop, uh, urban centres, not necessarily so. So, so having a shelter readily available becomes a bit of a challenge for us. Um, so the other thing we need to really consider is preparedness as well, because because of the, the, the attacks on the critical infrastructure, certainly over the winter periods, this causes this tremendous uh, hardship for, the, for, for the, not only the, the population, but also the UN staff. So we, we've had to equip all of our personnel with things like big power banks. Um, you know, we, we have to, to constantly brief them on the need to stock up on food, to stock up on water, to have all the um, cold weather clothing and stuff like this. And some agencies do actually provide that as well. So it's having, it's preparing our own colleagues for the harshness of the weather and the environmental conditions if the um, power generation facilities are, are, are destroyed. So the key sort of takeaways that I've got from, from my, my time here in Ukraine, uh, which has been over the past two years, um, first and foremost, is those physical security measures that we need to, to adhere to, to having the shelters, 
having the SRF, having alarms and warning systems and such like. Secondly, deconfliction. You know, we're, we're operating in some cities that are under uh, attack from the Russian Federation forces. So we need to deconflict not only with the Ukrainian military, but the Russian military. And also at the same time, when going on missions, we need to ensure that we have high visibility in the case of UN markings and livery on vehicles and flags and such like. And thirdly is the preparedness of our staff um, in order to, to relocate them should that be required. Uh, and that is, as I spoke about earlier, the sort of relocation plans. But on top of that, the go bags that everybody must have prepared and ready and available, uh, secondary con systems and such like that. So that's really all I've got to say. Uh, and, and I'll hand it back over to Dimitri now and, and take any questions later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roman, for providing such a detailed picture of the operational uh, challenges that are you facing currently in Ukraine, as well as many of the very uh, practical measures that uh, you are taking to try to support your wider teams uh, to, to remain safe and secure in a, a very difficult context. So very much appreciated your insights there. Uh, Shashwat has joined us uh, again. Uh, unfortunately, she ha he had some uh, challenges with some flooding uh, in Nairobi where he's based, but hopefully the connection has stabilized. So I will uh, circle back to Shashwat to continue where he was beginning his presentation. Thanks. Um, I, I started talking about Kabul and how um, in a span of six months, uh, we had to change premises uh, three times because of new buildings. Apologies, Shashwat. Perhaps you can turn off your camera and it might stabilize the connection. Is that right? Uh, in the context, it comes to be critical because uh, you decide your premises. Let's see. Let, let's give this a try and yep. see if it works. All right. Give it a shot. Can you hear me? Yeah, with a, a small hiccups, but. Have a go, and then we'll, we, I can let you know if the connection is stable enough. <laughs> OK. Uh, I, I'm trying, and I've actually moved from the regular network to the mobile network, but it still is breaking. I don't know if you can hear me clearly now. A bit better. Not. Yes, a bit better. Uh, so perhaps maybe you can keep your intervention a bit shorter to try to keep uh, the, the stable internet connection, or at least hope for the best. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think, unfortunately, we have continued to run into some challenges with the uh, internet connection for our panelist, Shashwat. Um, so while he tries to sort that out, um, you know, we can always just uh, open the conversation, first and foremost, to some of the, the questions, for instance, that Rob had posed at the tail end of his presentation. And, uh, you know, Roman Reigns also available to answer any questions that you may have, specifically about his, his, uh, his particular context, but also just generally the operational challenges and the solutions to, to take when it comes to security risk management. So um, Rob, happy to, for you to put that in the chat and we can uh, use as a, as a starting point or a prompting question. And then for others, please feel free to uh, either raise your hand or to add your questions in the, the chat box itself. And we'd be, happily, uh, we'd be happy to respond to those questions uh, as and when they come. All right, I just I just typed it in there, but it just to say it again, it's just sort of the curiosity on my mind is the extent to which people actually see value and sort of buy into the premise of this panel and, and this report that 
that it makes sense to talk about this thing that we are calling urban SRM and sort of carving that out as a particular thing. And to what extent you might perceive that, uh, yes, challenges and um, uh, um, approaches in one urban context might uh, usefully inform uh, those in another uh, urban context and that some, you know, from a research standpoint, comparative analysis, but from your standpoint, like sharing lessons across contexts uh, might be a useful project to push, push forward um, in the world of, of SRM. So that's the question that I, that I put forward to you and I'm interested to hear everyone's perspectives on. Thank you, Rob. Uh, is there anyone among the participant list here who's interested in, in responding to this or at least share some thoughts? Feel free to make yourself known either uh, via the, the chat box itself or to uh, raise your hand. I'm also happy to jump in as as people sort of ponder and um, sure. hopefully we'll uh, we'll jump in. I, I have a question for Roman, if, if, if it's OK for me to ask a question to, to Roman. Please go ahead. OK, OK. But Roman, I'm, I'm interested to hear um, uh, uh, Billy in your comments about how you see deconfliction, uh, the value of deconfliction, uh, humanitarian notification systems sitting alongside other uh, SRM approaches. It's something I've written about before for GISF, and I know it's like a whole conversation about humanitarian notification systems in and of itself. Um, but since you are operating in a context where that has been a key thing, just interested to hear your sense of how you how you see it, how you see it fitting into the broader SRM equation. Well, I can I can say that um, deconfliction isn't necessarily um, as effective in this context as we'd hoped it would be. So, in the early days, uh, whenever there was a mission being conducted, um, the UN would deconflict with both the, the Ukrainian and the the Russian Federation um, forces. And we would get a notification back from the Ukrainians pretty quickly, and we'd eventually get a notification back from the Russian Federation forces. Now, it would just be an acknowledgement, basically, that they had received it. Um, for the past, I'd say, 12 months or so, the, the Russians no longer even acknowledge that we've submitted it. So, um, you know, we still do submit it in, in the hope that it's, you know, that they do acknowledge it, the hope that they do sort of note, recognize it, but they very rarely acknowledge it. But the other perspective is, is we have a sort of list of, of cleared locations and cleared hotels, okay, that staff can use for, for accommodation or for uh, meetings and such like. And what happens is we generally choose relatively good hotels that have all the backup generators and, and you know, and, and, and or subsurface shelters and things like that, um, just because they meet our requirements. But what then happens is that some military people will go to use them and then you know some foreign fighters in, in occasions are, are going to use them as well just because they are relatively decent hotels and they then in the mind of the the russian forces become a um legitimate target because they're being used by military personnel so even though we've deconflicted with the russian federation about those locations all of a sudden none of that matters uh, and a number of occasions where hotels that are on the un cleared list have been directly attacked. So in this context, Rob, I have to say that it's not particularly effective, although we do continue to do it. Thanks very much. And that it's in line with the, re I've done a lot of research on uh, getting people's perspectives on humanitarian notification uh, systems and uh, I've heard many uh, concerns and critiques, not only in Ukraine, but other, other, uh, other contexts as well. So what you have said, uh, jives with what I've heard from others. But thank you for your comments. You're welcome. Thank you, Robin. Roman, I just want to flag a question that's in the chat from a uh, participant, Peter, who said, I'd be interested uh, to hear more about good practices with respect to security acceptance with insecure urban areas. Would any of you like, like to respond to this? I see. Uh, hands also raised by Jason. I don't know if this is in direct response to this, but if not, uh, I can always just uh, ask Roman or, or Rob to maybe have a go at responding to Peter's question, and then we can pass it on to Jason. Yeah, 
To be too unfortunate, I don't have any direct experience of that, so I wouldn't like to sort of speculate with it with an answer. So if there is somebody in the audience that is uh, more experienced in that, it would perhaps be helpful to hear from them. Okay, not a problem. Uh, uh, perhaps if not Jason, is there anybody uh, in the list of participants here who might be able to have a, a go at answering uh, this question? I see there's some um, uh, responses within the, the question itself uh, saying that it's a good question to ask. Perhaps Jason, uh, if you unmute yourself and you can uh, you can chime in here. Um, hi there. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Fantastic. Uh, so yeah, my raised hand is not to answer the question that just came in the chat. Uh, it was to actually address the um, question that uh, Rob had put earlier in the chat, and for a question for Roman. So, uh, so should I give take those now, or would you want? So we can circle back to Peter's question uh, a bit later down the line, but perhaps we can start with yours, and then that can help stir up some conversation that will uh, provide some some uh, some grounding for responding to Peter's question. So please go ahead. Uh, so yeah, sorry. So my que uh, response would be to Rob's question, sorry, uh, where he was uh, early asking about uh, to what extent we see kind of value in having a specific SRM for in urban areas. And I just wanted to comment on this is because at least in the work that we do, uh, so I work for a civil rights uh, organization. And so obviously when we work with people, as it has already been stated in this call here, most people live in urban areas nowadays. So by default, we're always going to be uh, operating within urban areas. And in our experience, we haven't been able to, we haven't seen any difference in the different types of urban areas, whether it's like, a uh, really large city or versus a slightly smaller uh, uh, kind of like urban hub. So we haven't noticed any um, kind of like differences in the way we need to operate, but just in our assumption is always going to be operating in an urban area because that's where people are. So that was just kind of like my uh, take to Rob's um, kind of question. And then if I may continue, I'd like to pose a question to Roman. Um, regarding kind of like the Ukraine specific uh, context. Now, because one thing you mentioned is like obviously that fatigue that uh, both locals and kind of like expats have when it comes to the alerts that come for like the missile attacks. So I just wanted to know how do you address this with your staff and make sure that they don't become too complacent. So even though yeah, you might get 10 alerts per day, how do you address like what's the procedure? Do you always insist that people go down to the shelters or how do you address that? Thanks. Thank you, Jason. And that is a question that's sort of constantly posed, um, and I'll try and answer it for you in a couple of ways. First and foremost, the, the, the way that I try to encourage people to respond to alerts is by responding every single time myself. Um, although we have to accept that the culture of an office is set by the head of the office, you know, I like to think that I'm fairly responsible for the security culture in the office. So every single time there's an alert, I go to the, the shelter. Um, and a number of my, and, uh, there are a number of key figures, members of staff that do also. But at the same time, the sort of the, the, the head of office, um, and, and this, this isn't just the head of UN Women, this is the sort of the head of the, the UN system in Ukraine has, has said that people can make their own decisions. So we get a number of different types. Of, we, we get sing, single alerts. There's one type of alert, basically, that that, uh, that notifies everybody that there is a threat. And then shortly afterwards, we tend to get more specific information. And on a lot of occasions recently, the specific specific information has been that there are MIGs in the air, MIG aircraft, as you know. Um, a lot of the times these MIG aircraft are on training sorties. So people are sort of playing the numbers game and thinking, well, in that case, you know, it's just another training sortie for the, for the, the, the air group up in Belarus or whatever. So we do leave it down to, to people to make their own decisions. Um, what you must also take into consideration is, and this is one of the things that we have to bear in mind about some of our staff, especially parents with young children. So if we get two or three uh, air raid alarms during the night, that family has to get up out of bed, they have to drag their children out of bed, they have to perhaps run 50 meters down the road to a shelter, and they have to stay there for an hour or so. And then when the air raid alert ends, they go back home. If that happens two or three times in a night. You can imagine how the sort of um, 
the, the disruption to, to, to the family and the fatigue and stress that this causes. So these are the type of things that we need to consider about our colleagues when they get a little bit tired and they let, get a little bit stressed in the office. You know, we have to bear in mind that they might have been through this two or three times in the night. So in short, you know, we do, as security professionals, try to encourage people to go. But at the same time, we also give them the sort of... Um, the, the 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 power to make the decision themselves. I hope that answers your question. See a positive hands up uh, or thumbs up. Sorry from Jason. So that's great. Um, Rob, did you want to maybe uh, respond to Jason's first point, responding to your question? If you have any thoughts about that. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, Jason, thanks for your responses uh, uh, about that, and and just to the uh, uh, to the audience writ large. Um, I, I can just say a few other comments about sort of where I'm coming from with this and sort of some of the other things I've I've heard from other people uh, in the SRM world that I've spoken to uh, about this is that I hear a diversity of views. I'm interested to hear um, from uh, uh, others as well. Um, uh, but on the one side of the spectrum is I hear some people are extremely enthusiastic about talking about urban SRM and um, looking at uh, different contexts and seeing uh, the particular challenges that that um, practitioners have seen of of uh, humanitarian S SRM uh, manifesting in in um, uh, in cities and other densely populated areas. On the other side of the spectrum, I did hear a lot of skepticism. So I welcome skepticism uh, if there are those out there who maybe want to push back on the whole premise of this panel. Uh, from people basically saying, I don't know, we have our SRM approaches, we have frameworks and tools, we apply them, whether it's an urban context or not. Uh, maybe there are different things about an urban context, but it doesn't require necessarily a different approach. Um, so that's one pushback I I, I heard. Another pushback I, I heard is essentially, uh, that, I mean, I alluded to this comment uh, earlier, that all cities are different, that there's a risk of overgeneralizing. Um, and even within urban context all city all cities are different but all types of disasters are different um so if we're talking about you know earthquake or flood response in a city um very different than an armed conflict response uh in a city the you know the situation that roman uh, sees uh in ukraine is very different from the situation that shashwat uh saw in in kabul that he uh, began to talk about and Hopefully, we'll continue to talk about if he's ever able to uh, to get back uh, uh, on the call. But those are some things um, uh, that I've heard. But again, interested to hear people's perspectives on that, and also interested to hear the extent to which, for people in the in the audience, some of these issues that I found in my research and issues that Roman uh, raised as well, the extent to which they resonate with your experience, the extent to which you have seen similar challenges manifest. And the extent to which you have seen different challenges that you might be able to um, throw at us to to help continue to fill in uh, the humanitarian urban SRM uh, picture, all very much welcome. Thank you, Rob. Um, are there any takers who'd like to maybe respond or have a bit of a pushback on this framing of SRM and urban environments being distinctly different from you know, SRM and other uh, settings as well? Dimitri, if I could just add a, a point there to Jason, one of the things that I, uh, that I, that I didn't respond with when he, when he asks about how do we encourage people to go to the, the shelter, one of the other things is whenever we have uh, all staff meetings, obviously I remind people of their responsibility to go to the shelter, but I also inform them that the Malicious Act insurance policy, which is out with the sort of personal health and medical insurance, that policy, should you be injured uh, or, or killed, that have you not responded, have you not taken the adequate precautions, that policy will be null and void. So should you be seriously injured or killed, you will not get, you're very unlikely to get any sort of payout from that insurance policy. So either you, for your medical bills, or for your family, in the result of your death, won't get any money. So trying to trying to convince them or coerce them, if you will, to, to go to the shelter by, by laying out practicalities such as that. Um, but more broadly, um, this complacency, as I've called it, um, is also a little bit of sort of pragmatism um, on, on, on the part of the, the Ukrainian people. And one of the things that I've noticed over my time here is this tremendous resilience that they've built up. Um, 
I'll give you an example. Back in uh, October 2022, there was a missile strike or two missile strikes on Kyiv. Uh, one hit a road junction between uh, the Ministry of Science and Education, and another one hit a, a children's play park about 150 metres from that road junction. It was right in my apartment, so I took a walk down shortly afterwards to have a look at the damage. Um, and within four hours of the missile of the strike, already there's people filling the holes in the road. 24 hours later, that road is fully operational again. People were driving across it. Took a walk to the play park. Already there were kids playing in the crater. So it's this resilience that the, the, the Ukrainian people have built up. They're not going to be, you know, uh, they're not going to have their lives dictated to them by these strikes by these missile strikes, because this has been going on for over two years now, you know, and they simply refuse to sort of cower to the, to the threat. Um, and they're just trying to get on with their daily lives. So that is, you know, we have to manage that with our staff as well. Our staff like to go out at weekends and have a drink and have some a meal or whatever. Kiev, for all intents and purposes, as are a lot of cities in Ukraine, is a normal functioning city. And our staff like to sort of take advantage of that. So it's really trying to make sure that whilst our staff are doing that and going about living their lives normally, that they are always considering the threats to them. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that, Roman. It's a very interesting perspective you brought to the table and the kind of resilience that you want to emphasize that's important there is, is, uh, is just fascinating, actually, a very good example. Um, yeah, I'd like to, again, pass it back to the audience and uh, and see if there are any sort of pressing questions that uh, anybody has that would like they'd like to ask the panelists or to GISF, um, and we can also um, you know revert back also to Peter's question about uh, good practices with respect to security acceptance in the insecure urban environments. Um, you know, uh, obvious things are you know strengthening community relations and so on, but uh, I'm sure there's potentially some some interesting insights that people can provide from the audience uh, as well. But feel free to, to to jump in with any question or response to any of the things any of the things sorry that have been discussed thus far. I'm happy to jump in with another question for Roman as people as people gather your thoughts. The people, we want to hear from you. I, I see you. I see your names in there. We have a lot of experienced people here. We need Now's the time. We need to hear your stories. Tell us your urban SRM stories. But I'm happy to pop another question to Roman so we're not sitting here in awkward silence for too long, if that's okay. Unless someone else is queued up. Yeah, that's fine. I just want to uh, acknowledge a comment from Nick, Nick Odong from UNHCR. Yeah. We're responding to, to your question about to what extent you value and focusing on urban context as a particular domain of SRM. And he says, urban areas are vulnerable to a range of security risks from crime and terrorism to natural disasters and pandemics and requires a two-sided approach of both hard security measures, such as law enforcement, structural design, and surveillance technologies, as well as soft approaches, which is something that you alluded to uh, and, and delved into in your, your presentation, Rob, uh, like staff training and adherence to guidelines, community engagement, and resilience building. So he's basically uh, sees where there is some value to talk about it and the unique dynamics at play in the urban environments. But please feel free to jump in, Rob. Uh, got you cool, Nick. Thanks for your response. Everyone else, keep it coming. Keep it coming, people. Give us, give us, give us, give us some juice. Uh, but Roman, um, uh, building on the deconfliction question, and as I am someone interested in uh, all of the challenges and dilemmas of technological solutions to humanitarian problems, um, I'd be curious if you can tell us more about alert systems and public address systems and how you see those sitting in the full SRM picture. What challenges you see in what ways they have been useful, indispensable, or less so? Tell us about that. So the, the, as I said, there's two ways really that we receive alerts in Ukraine. First and foremost is the public address systems, which are you know across the city. Uh, and secondly is the alert um, that we would, the, the app, alert apps basically, of which there are a couple. Um, Generally, they work pretty well. Okay, so you, you know if if you are if you're out in the city somewhere and you you know the the alarm goes off, it's it's pretty audible. But I was, and if you're in a hotel, for instance, uh, then generally the hotels will have a public address system as well, which will be activated during the alarm. But I was um, looking at a hotel the other day because of a high profile visit we've got coming, and speaking to the the, the manager there, he said we've sort of we've turned off our um, alert system within the hotel because the guests don't like it and it, it disturbs them. Uh, so now that's you know that's one thing that you you know you you have to consider if you're staying in a hotel. Now 
you need to ensure that you have your app on and you know and, and you sort of your sound on to make sure that that does alert you otherwise chances are the, uh, you're not going to hear the alarm so that's 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 one of the challenges that we, we found recently Got it. Thanks, Ray. Thank you, Roman. I, I see Rob has also asked the question to another to the audience as well about to what extent does these issues resonate with your experiences. Um, very much like to hear from your own experiences, your stories around uh, this kind of security risk management that you've done in, in humanitarian urban environments yourselves, or any challenges you face, or any approaches that you've taken that you think could be included in the sort of best practices that was alluded to earlier in this conversation. Would anybody like to to, to jump in here? Please feel free to raise your hand or. Uh, add your uh, commentary on the chat box. All right, I see that uh, it's a, a bit of a more passive engagement, which is uh, perfectly fine, of course. Um, so in that case, if uh, we aren't receiving any more questions, um, we could potentially just go back to um, Roman and uh, Rob just to provide, oh, I see Peter has his hand raised. Please feel free to chime in. Sorry, good afternoon, Peter Roberts here. I was uh, just in the kitchen um, and I heard my voice there. Sorry, could you just repeat the question for me? Or you want me to follow up on my question? Yeah, please follow up on your question, if that's all right with you. Uh, so my question was on the security acceptance, uh, good practices in, uh, let's call them insecure cities. Um, and I was wanting to sort of ask, you know, the outcome of where this SRM process uh, into the urban environment um, on acceptance, really, because the whole deterrence and this morning we had the uh, seminar on uh, using private security guards and so on and the level of training because it is the first impressions that people get when they come into let's say your offices in these city environments but uh the only acceptance measure that i've ever achieved in a urban environment was where there was uh and this was Kabul, where there was a shortage of water and so we had a well and therefore we just put a big water tank on the uh on the wall of our compound that then allowed the community to freely access the water in that street um but uh you know it's it's difficult in in these urban environments where community ne isn't necessarily so strong and i've all i'm just sort of looking for other ideas and you know particularly in the uh in the middle eastern areas which is where my experience comes from but maybe there's thing practices we can do in africa as well um and that's why i was sort of wanting to ask the the panel there on their, their expertise of ideas of how to improve acceptance uh, over thank you peter and thank you for providing that uh, that example that really helps to kind of um put up a bit of practical application to your question. I don't know if that, uh, Rob or Roman, if you have some initial thoughts to respond to this. But I'll just say, say a couple of things. Um, in terms of solutions, it's not for me, researcher Rob, to offer you all SRM practitioners as solutions, but this is why we're interested to hear from people from the crowd. But I can say a, a few other comments about um, what I heard in terms of framing the challenge and, and the gravity of the challenge that I think resonates with um, uh, what, what Peter said is that essentially what I heard from people I uh, interviewed uh, is again, a, a spectrum, a range of, of responses um, in, in general terms. I mean, Dimitri, you essentially said this uh, uh, earlier, and I, I, I know that this is sort of just repeating what has always been written about uh, acceptance is that it, you know, uh, requires a sustained effort, sustained community engagement. It requires uh, resources. It requires uh, planning. It requires a great deal of um, uh, attention and um, and care. But at the same time, at the other end of the spectrum, I did hear from some interviewees a high level of essentially skepticism about actually the value of an acceptance approach in an urban uh, context, certainly comments about the challenge of in an urban setting, you're less visible as a humanitarian organization, that you are much more lost in the crowd in a crowded um, 
a tapestry of different organizations and networks that are uh, existing and harder to carve out a uh, visible uh, name for yourself uh, in, in the community, but also more in the skeptical side. The skepticism uh, essentially that, I'll throw this out there, that it is even possible to effectively um, uh, apply an acceptance approach in a densely uh, populated area to truly uh, root an acceptance approach on your principled uh, approach as a humanitarian uh, uh, conducting operations in line with impartiality, neutrality, and uh, independence, especially given all the challenges I uh, mentioned um, uh, mentioned earlier. But I put put that out there for discussion um, uh, for uh, uh, for you all. Um, so there you go. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Roman, do you have any um, immediate thoughts uh, regarding Peter's uh, intervention? No, because obviously it's acceptance isn't really an issue for us here in Ukraine. You know, all of our beneficiaries are, are um, you know, are, are on side, if you will. But what, what is interesting is, um, you know, talking about these, uh, when, when Rob talked about balancing hard and soft approaches earlier on, um, we, as the UN, we, we have this sort of battle whereby we need to show a presence, so we need to be visible, okay? So that means driving around in UN vehicles, you know, with UN delivery on the side and this, that, and the other. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of the times, those are big armoured vehicles. So we're trying to sort of show ourselves as being part of the effort, being part of the community. Um, but at the same time, we, there's, there's still that sort of distinction that these are big white vehicles that shoot through checkpoints and they've got diplomatic plates and blah, blah, blah. And we have faced negative publicity here in Ukraine because of it. Um, so again, this is a challenge for us trying to show enough of a, a presence, uh, but at the same time, not being those UN people that sit you know, in, in big white vehicles or, or, or big UN buildings, basically. Thank you, Roman, I appreciate that. Uh, I just also want to acknowledge a couple of uh, comments on the chat. Um, a desire to talk about uh, the situation in Haiti and Pelo Prince. I see Peter, your hands raised. I will get to you in a moment. And then just a response from David F. Trenner uh, from Concern Worldwide, basically um, painting a contrast of how their, their office is a nice, decorated, and friendly office space. And their staff in port au prince have to deal with realities of living with gangs every day and seeing violence and dealing with trauma. And their office has a nice patios, outdoor furniture, good coffee meeting places for staff to relax and do their work. And it's a place to recharge their batteries, uh, which is uh, you know an interesting uh, kind of uh, take given that you think about urban environments sometimes in insecure places being uh, somewhat unsettling. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll revert back to Peter here. I see your hands raised once more. So please feel free to, to jump in and maybe ask another question or provide more thoughts um, based on what the panelists have said. Uh, thanks. And uh, really just to uh, follow up on Roman's point there on, and it was a good point on the barriers that you create um, okay, we don't have armored cars, but you know, reasonably nice cars, logoed and uh, okay, not quite the compounds and so on at this stage in Ukraine. And I'm sorry, specifically talking about Ukraine, but one of the challenges is when you go down to these uh, villages around Kherson or Kharkiv area, and you you're you've you've told your team right, body armor and helmets and sort of two two vehicle convoys and radios. You look quite. Um, uh, uh it, it does create a bar a barrier to the the beneficiaries that you're trying to support and help and uh certainly what we've tried to do is uh decentralize the power as much as possible to the team leaders who are trained but to go look is this realistic in the area that we're in there hasn't been any uh attacks in the last 48 hours have we found uh, uh proper cover that we can be working with beneficiaries and can we then say right we can take our body armor off and be more approachable with working with the community in those areas there's just a point i wanted to throw into the group there uh from a practice point of view thank you very much peter for bringing that on board uh are there any sort of immediate thoughts based on the, the kind of different aspects of the conversation that have come up from uh resilience to some more practical approaches and best practices um yeah, uh, very much welcome. More interventions from the floor. We'd like to have a open and uh, honest conversation about this. Uh, 
For instance, uh, the previous comment uh, that David put out, put out there, would it be possible perhaps to expand on how this contrast between the more friendly environment that uh, your office is, is, is set in, given the, the situation that's been unfolding or the crisis has been unfolding in Pueblo Prince, how that contrast is playing out in terms of your own humanitarian security or not? Um, yeah, I think it's just more a safe space for staff to kind of recharge and um, discuss issues they have, like when they're out and they're doing field work. Um, so I think it's just a, like a open office space as well is good that they can approach managers and so on. Um, and also for, yeah, they feel comfortable and they can relax a bit and be stressed as well. So, um, so we'd have a lot of artwork done by our community groups in the office and, um, yeah. And okay. it's, it's an important point to try to, you know, keep, uh, well, obviously for, for mental health and so on for the staff to, to basically have a, um, a sort of livable environment from which to operate from. And that makes, uh, makes sense, uh, in terms of, uh, keeping the staff engaged and uh, also taking measures to um, keep them going essentially in very difficult circumstances. Um, to add to that is, is a point about psychosocial support. Um, it's, it's, it's one of the things that we've started to focus on pretty heavily here, uh, just because the, 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 the trauma, certainly for our national staff of families that might have been moved from originally from the Donbass to, to somewhere else in Ukraine, and then moved from Kyiv uh, west during the invasion when they all had to relocate. We understand that there's a sort of there's a build up of stress within our with our colleagues that really needs addressing. It's not so much an issue for international staff because we're on an R and R cycle and therefore we get to leave the country every so often. But certainly for our national staff, um, and I don't forget some of those can't actually go abroad at all because they're male. Um, we really need to concentrate on this. So just adding to the point that David made there is not just creating you know, a physical environment where people feel relaxed and safe, but also providing them with the psychosocial support, uh, which some of them, you know, which a lot of us clearly need. Thank you for uh, spec specifying that, uh, the importance of psychosocial support, absolutely, and the distinctions between international and local staff and their ability to uh, get some some much needed rest and and so on. Uh, I see another comment from uh, David Trainer about acceptance as well as good community relations is ensuring that you have the quality programs designed with communities and a complaints mechanism for beneficiaries to be able to raise their concerns. And if you are uh, if you so so you are aware uh, that if you do mess up, uh, you're honest when you do, and that you can work on solutions. So that perhaps is a indirect response to Peter's question from earlier as well about um, that kind of community engagement that's needed to build acceptance in those insecure urban environments. So th uh, thank you for that, uh, David. Um, Roman or Rob, I don't know if you have any um, quick thoughts regarding this. I'll just say uh, a few uh, remarks, um, especially building off a uh, discussion about uh, Port-au-Prince. I'll just mention um, in the... Um, in the GIS uh, report, there are a few mini case studies that sort of illustrate uh, many of the issues that uh, we've been discussing in uh, this session. One of them is Mogadishu, which is the uh, case study used to illustrate all of the um, issues surrounding um, the creation and impl implementation of a, a green zone. Uh, there is a case study, case study of Aleppo, uh, that is in some way in the same world uh -huh. issues that uh, Roman has been talking about uh, in Ukraine. But one of them is also uh, uh, Port-au-Prince, which is essentially uh, focusing on uh, engagement with um, uh, with armed gangs. And it's an issue where we see the intersection of uh, humanitarian negotiation, acceptance, uh, and, um, and SRM uh, coming together, but um, it has been a challenge that I've heard from from many um, of uh, negotiating with uh, armed gangs. If there are those in the audience that that are that have worked in or familiar with the uh, Port-au-Prince uh, context that maybe have uh, experience in this regard, very much welcome for you to uh, bring your experiences to the floor, whether that's David um, or uh, uh, or others. Um, but it, I see it as an area in which there seems to be a need for additional discussion and 
and uh, research uh, uh, to be done. So very much welcome comments from from the crowd uh, about that. Uh, should you have them and should you feel the urge to bring them to the floor? Thanks very much. Thank you, Rob. I don't know if there's anybody in the audience who wishes to respond to, to Rob's suggestion here. Um, or else we can also take a number of uh, final questions before we uh, finish off with some concluding thoughts from our panelists. All right, well, if there are no other questions, um, I'd very much like to just pass it back to both Rob and Roman to just highlight some really key uh, points that you'd like the audience to take away from the session and uh, what may need to be considered when looking further into how to practice effective SRM in urban environments. Uh, you know, some of the questions were um, difficult to answer and therefore it seems to be some, some more room for, uh, for, for further thinking around this and further research. But yeah, uh, perhaps we can start with Rob and then pass on to Roman. Sure, thanks, Dimitri. Um, I mean, I, as a researcher, always seem to see that there's room for further further research. So perhaps I'm biased, but I just do have a sneaking suspicion that there is something to this, that there is much more work that could be done on the topic of uh, urban SRM that would be uh, useful in in uh, supporting the effort to push forward this conversation of this thing that we're calling uh, um, uh, humanitarian uh, urban uh, SRM. Um, um, I, and, uh, I, I, you know, one reason I say this is because I do feel like at least, you know, the report is very much laying out challenges. There are some ways in which, uh, the report, uh, points towards solutions, but I think that's, that's the next step is, um, uh, doing a more thorough job, taking the next step of surveying different challenges, uh, faced perhaps creating a different typology of different, uh, urban, uh, SRM uh, settings. Um, and um, uh, and collecting solutions and approaches and creative ideas that have been um, uh, uh, that have been tried because um, what I you know always aspire to do as a researcher in this setting is to make sure that uh, lessons learned that practices adopted don't just sort of fall into the ether that somehow they are collected and uh, brought to the fore so that. The experiences that people have had uh, in the past, the challenges faced are not necessarily um, uh, repeated uh, in the future, but that we can uh, learn from uh, one another. So that's my goal as a researcher, and I suspect that there's uh, something to be done here more uh, in this domain. Thanks very much. Thank you, Rob, and hopefully you'll be able to provide some of that research uh, going forward. Uh, you know, building upon your uh, the report that you highlighted at the start. I just want to acknowledge that uh, Stephen Thomas from the Headington Institute, likely responding to uh, Roman's uh, comments about uh, resilience and um, psychosocial support. I'm just going to read the comment. He said, the importance of personalized and contextualized self-care plans cannot be overstated when considering uh, the psychosocial uh, support and resilience of staff. Uh, while SRM plans are often contextualized, they may not always include a psychosocial component. So it's important to remember that individuals who are struggling mentally and lack appropriate resilience may experience difficulties in concentration and decision making, and their abilities for crucial uh, that are crucial for making appropriate decisions during uh, critical and heightened security incidents might be affected. Uh, and that's you know that has been uh, positively responded to too. So maybe that's a good uh, segue point for Roman to reiterate some of the key takeaways you think are absolutely necessary when considering SRM in these spaces. Please go ahead. Well, well I, I can kind of segue, segue to for the point that I was going to make. Um, and, and this point is around the stress that's caused by this constant specter of having a cruise missile, you know, launched at you. And it's about really risk tolerances. If we look at the sort of risk tolerances of, you know, mitigation, transfer, avoidance, and acceptance. Um, my question to you, or my question to the audience is, how much risk are you willing to accept? Because there are very few mitigation measures for the threats that we, the key threats that we face here in, in Ukraine. Because with the best will in the world, I as a security specialist cannot do a great deal about an incoming S-300 cruise missile. So you have to, at some point say, okay, we, we recognize the threats. We recognize that there's not a lot we can do to mitigate against it. 
other than living in underground bunkers all the time. And by doing that, you're simply not going to achieve your aim. It's, it, there's absolutely no point in peer, being here. So for me, the, the question from this context is, is asking people, how much risk are you willing to accept in order to achieve your, uh, your aims and go about your operational duties? Thank you, Roman. That's a very you know pertinent question and all things SRM, but uh, it's uh, it's something that obviously has to be a foundational question that needs to be answered every time you're engaging in, in various contexts in your humanitarian operations. Um, just want to flag also that Rob um, has offered uh, his email address in case anybody's interested in uh, sharing their the reactions to the report, any of their stories and their perspectives. Um, you know, surely uh, we'll be able to make connections if need be. With also Shashwat, who unfortunately uh, due to connection issues. Uh, was unable to to get back uh, in touch with us, uh, and and that's uh, unfortunately uh, meant we had le one less panelist to engage with. But um, yeah, uh, very much uh, thank you both and uh, all the participants for uh, engaging in this topic. Uh, I think this is a topic that uh, definitely needs uh, some further digging into and uh, looking delving into rather, and uh, and you know clearly is one that is very much at the forefront if you look at everything that's happening in the news today. So um, thank you for all. Uh, to take, taking part in this, and uh, we hope you have a good chance of reading um, the the report. And also, um, just to note that um, GISF is also uh, hosting a number of other events during the Chimpa W week. Um, so the for the the in person week as well. So please check the event program for more details. And uh, yeah, uh, feel free to reach out for any questions or queries you may have to to ourselves or to any of the panelists. Um, there's a session list that uh, my colleague Christian has put in the, the chat. So um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. And thanks again for joining and hope you have a good rest of your, your day. Thank, Thank you all. Take care. Thanks so much, everybody. Why not install?